first energy symposium for the fall semester. Glad to have you all show up. Uh, got a wonderful speaker this afternoon, Jean. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I got something in my throat. Jean Preston has been with basically UT almost his entire, I don't want to say like your entire life, but certainly your entire career that goes all the way back to 1972. I, I moved here in 1970. Okay. Well, Gene got his PhD in electrical engineering here in 1997. Uh, he spent pretty much a career working for Austin Energy from 1970 to 1998. Uh, as anybody with a PhD in electrical engineering knows, the world is a very complicated place, especially when you start talking about transmission grids and reliability. And since retiring from Austin Energy, he's been a private consultant in the field, consulting for ERCOT, the Public Utility Commission, and others on grid reliability and transmission issues. As you've probably heard, there have been debates for decades on how much renewable energy can you put on the transmission grid before it becomes unreliable. And in the early days, those numbers were in the single digits until we surpassed them. And then it was 10 percent until we surpassed that. And then it was 20 percent and we surpassed that. And then it was 30 percent and we surpassed that. So there was always somebody out there saying, oh, you can't do this. Uh, Gene has done an extremely good job of modeling these systems and coming up with formula and simulations to look at just how much can a particular grid take during different times of the year of how much renewable and what type of renewable can be injected in the transmission grid and still maintain a level of reliability that's optimal. Uh, Gene is a rather unique guy. I was reading your bio, which didn't exist, so I went to your website, and I love this man. Anybody in his spare time looks into the Pioneer 10 anomaly, the gravitational anomaly, and tries to adjust Newtonian physics to explain for non-zero point gravitational potential to explain the phenomena. And actually, you came up with some pretty good results. I was reading through your final uh, adaptation to it in 2012. It's, it's There's interesting There's a fellow stuff. at Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I, Martin Lowe, we're working together. We have a yeah. new theory. It works beautifully. Now we need to figure out. Now I need to figure out if it's, if it's real. The next step is to build a model of the Milky Way <laughs> and show the, the barrel, how the barrel rotates, and the arms. Yeah, that's the next step. Cool. Well, so <clears throat> leave, leave it to say that uh, he's a rather unique individual, very deep thinker, and very, very intelligent and very creative mind and inquisitive mind. Uh, he's going to talk to us tonight about the methodologies he's developed for doing these analysis, as we talked about. So if you would give him your attention, we've got about 45 minutes. And feel free to ask him questions as you go if you want to. And your mic's on. Good. Thank you very much. You. Well, okay, you don't have to clap. <laughs> so I came here in 1970, worked for Austin Energy. At the time, I was wondering, why am I in Austin Energy? I couldn't find a job anywhere else. So I was in electronics. But uh, what I found out is that in Austin Energy, they had no computer capability. They had no engineering computers. Nothing. So it was like wide open. I thought, wow, this is cool. So I worked there over the years, and we developed engineering tools and com computers. So uh, in 19, around 1985, we had the, the Generation Adequacy Task Force in ERCOT. This is where we study whether is, is there enough generation to meet the load. That's the question. Is there enough generation to meet the load? <clears throat> so we developed a Monte Carlo program. This was... Uh, Dr. Patton and Singh over at A&M. And it ran so slow. Oh, it ran slow. We'd have week-long runs. So at that point, about in the mid-'80s, I, I thought, there's got to be a better way to solve this problem. And that's when I started working on my PhD. And I, my whole purpose has been to use direct calculation techniques, not Monte Carlo, but if you can avoid Monte Carlo and you can have a direct calculation technique, you'll get better answers. <clears throat> I must say that uh, around the year 2000 onward, the whole world is relying almost exclusively on Monte Carlo. So in no. Uh, so I, I started doing studies using direct, my direct technique on ERCOT, pushing wind and solar to high levels and calculating reliability indices. And the IEEE uh, risk reliability uh, committee guy saw what I was doing, and he said, uh, Gene, would you like to come to a meeting and present some of your ideas? And I did. It was in Denver a couple of years ago, <clears throat> and we, I had a graph where it showed that the capacity value of solar declines as you put more solar in. Well, that caught the interest of NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Council. They were very interested in 
solar power, because solar is a big thing now in, in the United States coming online. And, and I, had, I had the most clear analysis showing how as you add more solar, the capacity value declines. And I'll explain why that's the case. It's very simple to understand once you see the graphs. Um, so they hired me. And I've been working for NERC. And what this is right here is a is the result of a study and a, and a paper that was presented uh, this summer. It's uh, NERC's in my paper on, on uh, what's the capacity value of wind and solar um, and, and how does that affect the reserve margin. The reserve margin is where we, we want to have a little bit of excess generation for things that break, generators that break. And so we have to figure out uh, how much we can count on the wind and solar in these calculations. And that's what, that's what uh, the study did. And that's why I was giving this uh, presentation to ERCOT. So uh, when, I, when I first showed this uh, presentation to other professors, they said, there's not enough background information. You're going to need to uh, give your audience a little more information. So this slide right here is to give you a little bit of background. <clears throat> In 1965, I think it was out in the middle of the night, there was a generator called Big Alice in New York. It tripped offline. That started a series of transmission lines overloading as there was too much power flowing into the area. So there was this cascading situation where transmission line would overload and it'd trip out. Well, when that line tripped out, the other lines would overload and then that line would trip out and trip out. Pretty soon you had a wide region blacked out. And uh, the power was out for about 13 hours. People were trapped in elevators. It was a big mess. The whole city came to a grinding halt. That was sort of a wake-up call to the U.S. So the the National Electric Reliability Council was formed in 1968 to address this issue. Later on, they changed the name to North American Electric Reliability Corporation when um, they started getting their funding from utilities. They made it a, a sort of a private business that's independent of utilities. Now everybody reports to NERC. So, um, even before the 1965 blackout, the first 345,000 volt transmission line was built between Houston and Dallas. The reason was because each region would have to build in more excess generation if they had a plant failure. But by building a transmission line between the two regions, now they could share their resources, and they didn't have to build as much generation. So it made economic sense. The transmission line didn't cost that much. So before I came to Austin Energy in 1970, there, was a, uh, there had been completed a loop around Texas. The loop, the 345 kV loop, went from Houston to Dallas to Fort Worth, down to Waco, uh, Austin, San Antonio, Corpus Christi, and then back up to Houston. So it's formed a loop. There really was no power flowing on this loop. It was floating. And it, it act, all, all the major cities were connected together so that if there was any kind of power outage in any city, we could rely on this backup. Um, so today, uh, NERC requires all the regions to do reliability assessments. They have to study the system run all these tests, show that their systems are reliable. In spite of this, there's still been blackouts in 77, 82, 96, 98, 03, 2011, and 2012 in the U.S. These are just U.S. blackouts. Okay, so I threw in these last two lines right here to emphasize the importance of reliability and give an example of why it's important. When Harvey came into Houston the other day, the HEB stores had their own power supplies built into the store. They call it a microgrid, but actually what it was was a small gas generator tied to the gas. They were able to stay online and operating, although the power was off, to supply. This means that they could keep 
their store open, they could supply water, they could supply food. This became an important resource to keep people from starving in the region. But the chemical plant that exploded because it lost power, well, they should have had, they should have, you know, had a better uh, backup. The problem is that their backup generator is underwater. Same problem Fukushima had. They put the backup generator down at the ocean level. A few miles north, there was another nuclear plant. Its backup generator was up high. No problem. The, when the backup generator flooded, they couldn't fire up the uh, standby generator, and then they had a big problem. I just want to emphasize that the loss of loads, uh, loss of critical loads can be devastating. So what, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to measure the reliability of the system. And we're only going to measure whether we have enough capacity in generation to meet the load. I'm not going to talk about operations. I'm not going to talk about unit commitment. If you try to solve what's called a unit commitment problem, it's, it's extremely difficult to solve, very time consuming. So in our paper, we had, uh, we just had some statements here that are openers. NERC is responsible for the reliability. They're going to have variable energy resources. They're worried about that. Uh, they want a minimum, minimum loss of load expectation of one day in 10 years. That's been sort of a traditional definition. I'll explain what that means, one day in 10 years. This is very confusing. Most economists get it wrong. You will know exactly what we mean by one day in 10 years. Um, what we have found is that uh, variable energy resources have to be treated as negative demand, hour by hour. Uh, I'm going to explain why you cannot uh, treat wind and solar as generators in models. You'll get the wrong answer. Uh, we're going to use a capacity outage probability table to calculate loss of load probabilities. I'll show how that works. Uh, we, we're going to create this capacity outage probability table in a very special way so that it will get exact answers. Um, now the reserve margin um, is going to be tested for wind and solar using, using, these, uh, using this computer program. Okay, so there's a widespread, widespread belief by a lot of engineers that you have, you have to simulate time sequence events with a Monte Carlo simulation where you run through time, you, you repeat the year over and over, over and over again in a Monte Carlo simulation. That's what a lot of engineers believe. So, um, so what they will do is they'll, they'll run their model and they'll count the number of events. They call them events, loss of load events. They're running the program along in time. All of a sudden, there's not enough generation because they have these random outages of generators in the model, and they will count it as an event. But it's easy to show that the definition of the probability if, if I knew the loss, this is, this is a demand curve here. It's a simple little model. So this, this is the demand. We have about 9,400 megawatts right here. 110 generator example. I created this example just as a test case. Uh, the very definition of probability, the loss of load probability, is the number of events divided by the number of trials. And in fact, if you solve this problem with the direct method, the COPT we use, or Monte Carlo. I let this thing run all night long, million iterations, they got exactly the same answer. <clears throat> this is very bothersome to a lot of people who are experts in this area. They will argue with me that, no, Gene, I can prove that your answers will be different. But they haven't, they've never shown me an example where they were able to prove that. So let's look at a more broad definition here. The, the loss of load expectation, uh, you, can, you can calculate it as the sum of the daily peak loss of load probability. It's the sum of them. And we would like for that number to be no more than 0.1. And you can calculate it with the Monte Carlo program by counting the days in which you have events divided by the number of trial years. 
Now, ERCOT recently invented a new term called LOLEV, events. They, they, they were using a Monte Carlo method. And the difference between the LOLE and the LOLEV is in the LOLE, you only count an event once. If a day has loss of load, it's, it's one day. See, the, def, the, the units are days per year, one day. And if you have two loss of load events in one day, it's still a day. Uh, over that count. So, but in LOLEV, what you do is you count all of the events and you don't worry about when they occur. So you can have uh, more than one event during a day. Now in ERCOT, the, the demand peaks um, sharply in the summer. And so right now, these two values will be the same for ERCOT. California has what's called the duck curve. The duck curve is where they have a peak in the morning, they have a lot of solar power come online, the net demand dips, at sundown the net demand comes up again and they have another peak. So they have a before sun peak and they have an after sun goes down peak. So you can have two, two peaks that day, you can have two, uh, two events. And in, in my program I, I look at both of them, I capture both of them. And these peaks, these, these, double, these dual peaks, you, you can look at the probability of the, you can look at the LOLP for the morning peak and the LOLP for the afternoon peak, and you can actually count the number of occurrences that will happen in the Monte Carlo program, and it'll agree exactly with Monte Carlo. Okay, so we're gonna use, um, we're going to have to create a curve which shows the probability of generation being available. Now, this curve right here, this P max is the sum of all our generators. And um, if, we, if we create, if, if we had a distribution, we could create a distribution curve here where we have a, uh, the area under the curve is one. Uh, and you, and you had these generators randomly outaged, it would be like a distribution. And then when you integrate the distribution, you get this curve. I, I like to just work directly with this curve. This curve right here can be easily created directly. And the way you create it, let, let's say we wanted to add a generator to this curve. It's very easy. What we do, this, this is a method that was invented by uh, a French guy named Ballaroo as an approximation. And then a guy in, in Australia named Booth, um, he said, that's an exact process. I get exactly the right answers. And so by, in, in the 60s, uh, Ballaroo, by guessing a solution, uh, was, was able to come up with this method. But the way it works is, we, what we do right here is we take this curve, this is before we add the generator. Let's say we want to add a generator that has an outage probability of 10%. What we're going to do is we're going to take this curve and scale it down to 10%, same shape, okay? Then we take the same curve, scale it to 90% because our generator is on for 90% of the time and extend it to the right by the capacity of the generator. And then we add the two curves back together and we get a new curve. And that's all you have to do in this curve to add each generator. So each generator, you don't have to develop a huge binary tree. You can just take each generator one at a time and add them until you finally get this capacity, cumulative capacity distribution. Now, who did I lose on this? Does this, does this convolution process make sense? It's very easy. Ask a question. I'll go over it again. All, you, all you've got to do is when you add the next generator to this curve, is you take the different probabilities and the different megawatts and you just take this original curve, scale it to all these different ones and shift them by the megawatts and then add them back together. And you have a new curve. Well, there's a problem with this curve. The problem is that what we really want is the probability that we don't have enough generation. So what we're going to wind up doing with this curve is we're going to have to take one minus its value. What if, what if we got 
uh, up here we've got 1 minus 0.99, whatever. You see we've lost significance in this region right in here. This is the region where we, we're trying to capture accurate probabilities of not being able to serve the load. And just, just at the point where we're trying to capture the probabilities, we have low resolution in the computer. So what we want to do is we want to flip this whole thing upside down and backwards. This curve here is convolved by shifting the outage states to the right. So the 10% state we talked about a minute ago, we shift it by the amount of megawatts that are outaged, and we don't do anything. Well, actually, we do. We scale down. This, imagine this curve goes back to the left an infinite distance. So, so we'd have 0.9 back this way, and then we would add that to the other curve, which is shifted. And, and as we add those generators, we wind up with this, this function right here. Now, the nice thing about this function is these numbers get so small that we, we, get to cut, we get to cut it off. In other words, this might be 80,000 megawatts for ERCOT, but over here we only have to go out maybe 10,000 megawatts on the graph. And the, the, the accuracy here is extremely high. And another good thing about this inverted curve is every time you add another generator, the round off error, the numerical error of the earlier generators is scaled down. Accuracy is maintained. It's independent of system size. This thing maintains high accuracy for large systems. There's no limit to how big a system we can handle. Okay, so that curve that, uh, that goes down, this is, this is the way to interpret a stair-step function. Now, Roy Billington in uh, 1986 published a paper where he had the small, uh, it's called the IEEE RTS, Reliability Test System. It's a small system with a few generators. It's such a small system that you can build a binary tree and you can take all the possible combinations of the generators. And so you go out the tree and you multiply all the probabilities and you sum the megawatts and you get a megawatt and a probability. And there's about a thousand of these on this binary tree for this small system. And what he did in his 1986 paper is he calculated the exact reliability indices for a year. He calculated the, uh, lo the loss of load expectation, the expected uncertain energy, uh, the, uh, and another, let's see, LOLP. Anyway, all, there's several reliability indices there. And uh, so, so the IEEE reliability group asked me if I was interested in adding wind to this model, this 1986 model. They had been trying for years to get some professor to volunteer to take on the chairmanship of adding wind to the RTS model. We're, I mean, they had been trying since, since 1996 was the last update, and it, the RTS model had, it had no wind or solar in the model. And I told Millerad, who uh, was chairman, at the time, I said, well, Millerad, I, I'm not going to take on that assignment unless I can duplicate the exact answers of the 1986 paper. Well, after fiddling around for a couple of weeks using these curves, I was getting exactly, this, I was getting exactly the same answers in his paper. And I thought, holy cats. Now, I did a PhD where I used piecewise quadratic curves with 100 megawatt increments, piecewise quadratic. Now, you, you give this piecewise quadratic equation a sp specific megawatt value, and you have to go through a bunch of equations to calculate an exact probability. So there's a lot of steps there. Here, all the generators were exactly even increments of one megawatt. So what I did is I said, well, let's just create this table in one megawatt increments then there's no interpolation. It's just a lookup process. So once you create this curve, you have a megawatts, you just grab it right out of the table. There's no processing whatsoever. This thing was running so much faster than my dissertation 
math, I said, what the heck? I'm going to throw away all my dissertation. This thing runs so fast. I'm going to use this for na from now on and just forget the PhD. You know, just use the one megawatt steps. <laughs> here's, here's the formula down here. These, this, this plus and uh, uh, the plus means after the fact and uh, the, the F, the, here's the function before and before, and then you've got uh, four outage rates, FOR. So that's a little formula that tells you that you're shifting the curves and adding them back together, basically, is all that says. Now, you can, you can, only, use, you can only do this if your generators are fully dispatchable conventional generators. You can't uh, use this for wind and solar, and I'll explain why in a minute. You'll get the wrong answers. Okay, so, so now, we, now we have a way to calculate the probability of being able to serve a load. So what is the load? Okay, so, you know, we, we could build some fancy model for wind and solar, but I thought, why don't, why don't we just take the historical data of several years and, and scale it, and let's just sweep through the whole time period. Let's, let's say that we have five or six years Let's say that our model for wind and solar is we're just going to start from the beginning and we're just going to sweep every hour, 60,000 hours, boom, because it's a lookup process. We already have our LOLP calculator over here, the COPT. So uh, the kind of data on the input here is we, we have an hourly file which contains the date and time stamp, the day of the week, the, uh, the ERCOT peak demand. In our, in our historical years, we normalize each year so that uh, the peak demand is one per unit. And also on this load, we use a seven-step uncertainty cause, because uh, ERCOT, because there's, they never do hit exactly what they forecast. There's, we have a 3% load forecast uncertainty. That means 3%, one standard deviation. But we're going we're gonna to include plus or minus three standard deviations which is going to move us out to uh, this demand right here, we're going to be testing up to 9% higher demand with a low probability. So, uh, so this, this column right here is actually seven columns when we calculate them. So how much, how much uh, wind and solar do we have? So here we have non-coastal. Let's say we want non-coastal wind. We have, we have this table here of hourly profiles, the history, the history of what happened. Uh, some of this history has to be created. Like we didn't have any wind in the panhandle. So what I did is I used uh, Texas Tech wind data and created profiles just from the wind data. And so there had been wind generators there. Then we have coastal, coastal profile. Interesting thing about the coastal profile is that it, um, uh, it peaks in the afternoon. You have onshore winds down in north, near Corpus, which uh, peak at the right time for the ERCOT peak demand. So people like this coastal wind better than, uh, than the non-coastal, although the panhandle wind will generate more energy, but at the wrong time. And then solar just follows the solar. Uh, in, in my solar data, we, ERCOT didn't have any solar data to speak of, so what I did is I, I collected uh, actual solar data for three locations in, in Texas and combined them to create this column here. So, so here we have uh, this hourly file and, and all we're going to do, all we're going to do is we're just going to take the demand for an hour, we're going to convert all these to megawatts for that hour, we're going to convert these to megawatts by taking the demand and subtracting the variable energy resource. Every hour, we're just going to subtract the variable energy resource. That gives us a megawatt value. That megawatt value is then plugged into the COPT, and we have the loss of load probability for that hour. That's a pretty simple model. Do, does anybody not understand how I'm going to calculate the loss of load probability every hour? I hope I'm not losing you. The professors think this is too complicated for you. 
But it's a very simple calculation process. Okay, so what happens when you use this model? So we ran, uh, we, we had 2016 and 2026. In 2016, we had, uh, we had quite a bit of wind, not hardly any solar. Um, so what I did is, is I created uh, three points. So we took the 2016 case and we took out the wind and solar and I calculated how much demand could be served for all these years, these historical years, so that the, load, so that the loss of load expectation was 0.1. Then after I got that answer, I looked at the year-to-year -year variation in the LOLE. It varies from year to year. That variation is due to the load uncertainty. Remember the spread in the load from year to year. It's the difference in the load shapes and the difference in the forecast. So there's about a 40% deviation in the LOLE over the time period without any, without any wind and solar. You go out to 2026, and you put all the wind and solar in that we, that we expect, and you run the same calculation again. Again, the case has a, has a reliability of 0.1. So, so here we had a case with the reliability of 0.1 days per year without any wind and solar. And we have another case where we have a lot of wind and solar with a 0.1 reliability. But look what happened to the deviation. It went up, even though my reliability measure of 0.1 was the same in both cases, the spread, the uncertainty goes up. This means that with a lot of wind and solar, you're going to have good years and bad years, and the bad years are going to be less reliable than if you didn't have the wind and solar. So it, it approximately doubles over just the load forecast. Does that make sense? Adding more wind and solar increases more risk. Because you're dependent on resources that are weather driven. Okay, so I mentioned the, the duck curve. In California, this curve kind of comes up and dips down and it comes up over here and it looks like a duck. That's why they call it the duck curve. But in ERCOT, uh, we can take one day as an example here. Um, we're taking one day, and this is a summer day. The peak demand is about 75,000 megawatts. We've got 26,000 megawatts of wind. In this particular instance, I put in uh, 30,000 megawatts of solar. And what it does is it dips the, ne the net demand. This is the, de the, the demand minus the variable resource. And here's the net demand. This is, this is the curve that the gas generators have to serve. Well, see, if, if we add more solar, it just brings this curve down, but the 8 PEM demand is the same. So for this curve right here, if we add more solar, there's no capacity value because there's no, capaci there's no additional capacity value of solar because we still have to serve the same load out here. And so what does that do? As you add more solar in ERCOT, here's what happens. If you have almost no solar in the system, which is where, kind of where we are now, it, it's about 80% value. And in fact, ERCOT calculates our solar in ERCOT at about 80%. So we're, we're in agreement on that. But if you, if you start increasing the amount of solar in ERCOT and you calculate the capacity value, how do you calculate the capacity value? In the model, in this, in this run here, what I did is I would, I would add solar, which improves the reliability, and then I would take out gas, which decreases the reliability, until I had the same reliability in both cases. So the ratio of the gas taken out divided by the solar added is, is what this curve is right here. This is like a percentage. So th this, is, this is the capacity value of solar compared to gas, gas plants. And so as you add uh, more and more solar, up here around 30,000 megawatts, the incremental value of solar goes about to zero, although the average value is still pretty high. Does anybody, 
Does, do y'all understand this? It has to do with the duck curve sundown at uh, the peak demand at sundown. And if you keep adding more solar, it doesn't really change the load at sundown. That's why this curve's going down. This right here, NERC was really interested in this curve. This was the clearest they had ever seen this presentation. Everybody was saying, yeah, it decreases. But this, this right here got me the job two years ago. Now, there is a problem with modeling wind. Let's say you have a bunch of different wind sites in Texas. They look like generators. They're on a certain percentage of the time. So you think, well, okay, let's, uh, let's give them some availability factor. Maybe we give them availability of 35%. This wind generator is 35%, that wind generator is 35%. So, so we have all these availabilities. Well, if you actually look at the ERCOT data, it's almost a straight line. By the way, if you were to flip this axis so that you had megawatts up here and hours going across and just sort the wind data, you, you get the straight line. I flipped it over and turned it into a probability curve. It's still a straight line. Um, so on the ends of this curve here, we have, uh, the, we have a period of time where there's no, oh, uh, okay, the wind never runs at full capacity. So when you take the ERCOT wind data, maybe it comes up to 85% of the, of the installed nameplate capacity. That's, that's like the maximum megawatts they produce. And then on the other end, you have a certain number of hours where you know, the wind doesn't run. And you, you can get this wind data from the ERCOT site, and you can just sort it in your spreadsheet and plot it, and you'll get a straight, almost a straight line. But if you build a model where you have um, wind generators in your model and you're treating them with this probabilistic availability, you'll get this curve here. Because your model, even if it's Monte Carlo, will assume that they are independent, unless you build in dependency between them. I asked Ross one time if he, Ross, would you like to put a weather model into your generation program? I mean, like cold fronts and stuff like that. No, Jane, I don't, I don't really want to put a weather model in my generation plan. But that's what, that's what we have. We have these fronts that drive the wind generation in Texas. And so there, there's a lot of, of uh, coupling between the wind generators. And when you just plot the data for the whole state, it's almost a straight line. Now, by using the original raw data, hour by hour, we preserve this relationship here, the way, we're, the way we were modeling. We've preserved that. No matter how many different wind sites we use, we, we're preserving that relationship between demand and load and the relationship between the different wind generators. Okay, so here was the purpose of the paper, the, paper, the, the IEEE paper and my NERC study. ERCOT currently values non-coastal wind with 12% uh, of its nameplate capacity. They value coastal wind at 55 and solar at 80. Now, the reserve margin calculation has nothing at all to do with dispatch or anything. All they're doing, all you're doing is you're just taking the peak demand and you just add up all the capacities of your generation and then divide by the peak demand and it'll be a little greater. It should be like 14% greater. ERCOT's traditionally had about 14% reserve margin. No, ELCC is a different calculation. The way ERCOT calculates these values is they take, they, they look at uh, 20 hours uh, of peak demands. And then they look at the wind output for those 20 hours and they average them. They average them. And so that average will get you about 12% for West Texas wind. It'll get you about 55%, about 50%. In other words, what, what they're doing for these, for these 20 peak hours, coastal wind is, is on average, uh, blows about 55% of the nameplate of the coastal wind. It, it sounds like it's a good idea. 
and it, and it, kind, of, it kind of works, um, and then solar is 80 percent. But here's, here's the problem. If you run a study out to 2026, in order to hold the loss of load expectation at the 0.1 days per year, you have to increase the reserve margin to 16 percent. You have to build. It, it, it's just a fictitious number. It's just a calculation. It's just a number, 16 percent. So if you, if you don't want to increase your reserve margin, what, you, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to reevaluate the value of the variable energy resource. Because if, if you had nothing but gas generators, and they always have the same forced outage rate, you would just have like a straight line across here for regular fossil generators. They did. They were valuing West Texas wind at 8.7 percent. They started doing this calculation of averaging and they got 12 percent. And so the 12 percent is a newer value. In the past they were using 8.7. They basically were being conservative in the past. They didn't want to overvalue. So the blue is the new PLCC. This is what they're doing right now. Okay. This, this is what will happen if they continue on the current trend with using these values, using their current value system. Now, if you, if you do a strict ELCC, you said ELCC. ELCC, the way you do ELCC, it's effective load carrying capability. You put in 1,000 megawatts of wind and you increase the load level until the reliability is the same. The amount that you increase the, the load level divided by the 1,000 megawatts is the ELCC by definition, effective load carrying capability. You put in the 1,000 megawatts, you effectively can carry however many megawatts uh, you increase the load level. But if you, if you do the strict ELCC calculation, you see that it actually undervalues the wind and solar if, if we want to be consistent with our 13 or 14 percent reserve margin. So there, there is not a unique definition for how you're going to assign these percentages. And just by playing around, trial and error, uh, I came up with, uh, uh, in 2016, maybe they should be using 10, 40, 70 instead of 12, 55, 80. But by 2026, because we've added a lot more wind and solar and their, their value has declined, we should be using 936, 68. Here's the problem in all of this. They like to do their future planning on a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet, they would like to just use the reserve margin. And they like to hold the reserve margin constant. They like to hold these things here constant. So if they just use the spreadsheet and they don't realize here that the reliability is dropping and they don't increase the reserve margin, in the last year, they're going to have an unreliable system, but they don't know it. The reserve margin has failed them. So what NERC and I are trying to get them to do is run the study out here and value the wind and solar correctly. That's what we're trying to get them to do. That's all, that's all it is. Just do the study and give it the right value. That's what this frequent LOLP analysis comment down here is about. Okay, so NERC, NERC wrote these recommendations. I didn't write these, NERC did. Um, am I standing in the way? Okay, so they want you to run reliability studies. I've provided them with this program. They have my programs. They can run these studies themselves on the regions. They're, they're going to give the regions hell with my software. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, they, but, you know, they're charged with keeping the, the system reliable. So this is their job. Um, now, it's very important to maintain the chronology between different variable energy resources and the demand. So we, we choose to use this simple historical hourly data. We're not processing it or anything. This, this drives statisticians crazy. They want to, like, process the data. In fact, the Pacific Northwest and the Western system, what they do is they process all of these years 
and they create the equivalent uh, standard year, one year. And so if you ask them for their data, they'll give you back one year for 2022. I've asked them, they gave me this. It's one year with some, devia some deviations around the load levels. Here's what they're missing when they just use one year. In looking at the California data, I noticed that uh, the hydro in 2014 and 2015 was low. It was about half of their normal hydro. And so I thought, well, is that really a dry year? I looked at the data, and it said 2014 and 2015 was the, but they were the driest years in California in the past 1,200 years. It's right there in my data. <laughs> I don't really need to create a more dry year. It's right there in the data. <laughs> you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to model a dry year. Well, it's already there. Uh, and so when you, when you run these years for California, you see, okay, they look pretty good, pretty good. Oh, my gosh, they have pretty high loss of load, pretty high, and then they're okay again. They had, they had a big problem uh, during these dry years. They had to rely a lot on their gas generation. So if they retire their gas generator, they have, they've got generators in there, their World War II stuff. So uh, one, one variation is to retire all their generation before 1980. That's 15,000 megawatts. And uh, it, it really plays hell with their system. Anyway, we're still doing that study. Um, one thing that NERC wants is they want this, uh, they want this hourly wind and solar data to be made public. They want, want it so we can download it and use it in our studies. That's reasonable. And California pretty well has their data listed publicly. ERCOT has the data. They used to list it more publicly than they do now. Um, you know, we used to have engineers in charge out at ERCOT, and now we have a lawyer. It's harder to get data now. <laughs> but I, but I, I do have, I do have Five good years of data, <laughs> you know, that I can rely on. Anyway, uh, NERC wants the VERs to be given capacity credits by running these loss of load expectation studies, loss of load probabilities. They want you to use the program, run the study, and evaluate uh, the capacity credits. Now, I was talking with Michael Weber, and he, I was telling Michael, Michael that we, the problem with wind and solar is it has such a huge variation. And Michael said, oh, I think we can handle it by shifting load. That we can handle it by shifting load. I thought, oh boy. I said, Michael, I want you to look at this. This is, this is a typical example. This is an extreme case that I ran where 50% of the energy is from renewables for the year. And I selected March of 2013. This is like actual, we're taking the actual hourly data in a historical march, and we're scaling it up to the really high levels of wind and solar. Well, we see we got 36 gigawatts of wind, 52 gigawatts of solar, and 48 gigawatts of storage. This green line here is, is the sum of the power production of the wind and solar. And you see it varies quite a lot. Uh, the black line is, is the load level the ERCOT load level that we would expect. And in, in the new program I have, it has storage, and it is able to deal with the storage on a day-to-day -day basis. This, this blue line right here is, is gas generation that comes online to serve load because there wasn't enough energy in the storage to serve that day, so we had to run the gas generators. But you can, you can see that if we, if, we, if we did not have storage, there's no way we're going to be able to modify this load to follow the green line. Now, uh, some people are telling me, well, let's just, just clip off the top up here, Gene, so that you're just, you're just going to have the renewables serve when they can. Otherwise, we're going to curtail, curtail the renewables. Well, if you do that, this number right here is going to drop down to lower number, 30%. You're going to be throwing away an enormous amount of energy. So that doesn't make sense. Do you all understand this? Does this make sense? 
Tell me what doesn't make sense. <laughs> ask me a question. Somebody, ask a question. <laughs> yes. What, the, what they're talking about is uh, loads that we can, you know, like water pumping loads. There's, there's a lot of loads that we can move time-wise. And so, so we're thinking, well, I, I was telling Harry Swinney, I said, okay, Harry, you've got too much solar power. How can you use it? Easy. When you've got lots of solar power, turn your air conditioner up, get the house freezing, so at 8 o'clock, you can turn everything off <laughs> and coast through the rest of the evening. That's the way to use the solar power. <laughs> That's shifting load. Get your house freezing earlier in the day so you can coast through the rest of the day. I mean, it's sort of, it's, I, I say that, it's, it's like it's alien to tree huggers, you know. <laughs> but that's what you need to do. You need to use the energy when it's available. Or you could have some way to do storage. Of course, you could have thermal storage in your house, some way to, you know, water cool or something, and then use that energy later. Any, any other questions? It's, it's just that these swings are just so enormous that we can't handle them. Now, there, there's also a transmission consideration, and I added an extra comment. Let's say that we had 40 gigawatts of solar in West Texas. We love solar in West Texas, and we have no storage. If we have 40 gigawatts of solar in West Texas, it's all going to be coming on at the same time. We've got to take the power. Each transmission line can handle 1,000 megawatts. We've got to build 40 345 kV lines from West Texas back to load centers to handle that peak power, which, which we can't even use the peak power because our load at level isn't high enough. However, if we put storage on the sending end, and considering that the solar has maybe a 25% daily capacity factor, uh, if we stored that energy, we could pump 1,000 megawatts continuously on those lines. We could get by with about 10 lines instead of 40. So we don't, I mean, 10 lines sounds a lot more reasonable. We, and also, if the solar energy was coming to us smoothly, not, not as this crazy peak, then, then we could figure out how to use it. We, we would use the transmission system effectively. Uh, the, solar energy, the solar energy would look like baseload generation. Baseload, the dirty word. But uh, that's what you're going to have to have. So as you add more and more uh, renewables, you're going to have to have the storage to match it. I told ERCOT, I said, keep your eye on storage. If we don't have storage, this whole renewable thing is going to come to a grinding halt. Right now, California has a website where they show how much energy they're losing because they have overproduction of wind and solar and hydro. And it's increasing every year. It started a couple years ago, and it's increasing. So what I did is I ran some cases here. Oh, there are breakpoints in ERCOT. There are interesting breakpoints. See if I can, as we're trying to increase the renewables. So the first one up here is 2016. 2016, and, and we're getting, in the, the model says we're getting about 15% of our energy from wind and solar, mostly wind. Okay, by 2020, 2026, now I increased the solar amount here in 2026. It turns out that uh, ERCOT wasn't quite reliable enough. Uh, they had a couple thousand megawatts of solar, so I just bumped up the solar because lately it looks like solar is going to grow pretty fast. So I bumped up the 2026 effort. And that got us up to 23.5%. Uh, now, this, this next line right here, I add, I, I add solar until we're at 14,000 megawatts. There was a uh, talk the other day at the Gulf Coast Power Association lunch, and the fellow talked about 14,000 megawatts of solar in ERCOT. The interesting thing about that is when, when you run 14,000 megawatts in the model, the net demand goes almost to zero, but not quite. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. The net demand at times during, during uh, spring and fall. 
So this 14,000 megawatts is kind of a magic number. However, if you, if you look at California and the amount of reserve generation, and we, and we have nuclear plants and things like that, we start getting into a problem around 7,000 megawatts of solar because we have to keep certain kinds of generation online. So uh, somewhere between 7,000 and 14,000 megawatts of solar, we're going to have to start curtailing uh, the renewables. And it doesn't matter whether it's on your rooftop or whether, uh, whether it's in West Texas. So that case with 14,000 megawatts, about 27 and a half, 28% of the energy is from uh, wind and solar. In the next step here, I, I just moved to pump storage. I added 5,000 megawatts of pump storage. We don't have any pump storage in our cut. California does, but we don't. Um, so there's no change here in the amount of renewable energy. What this did is it brought the minimum hour load level up by about 5,000 megawatts. So we don't have that minimum demand problem anymore. This thing does wonders for serving peak demands. And, I, and with, this, with this pump storage, I was able to retire 9,000 megawatts of coal plants. But that's not all the coal. So I thought, well, what do we have to do to retire all the coal? So the next case is a retire all the coal case. I had to bring solar up to 22,000 megawatts. Now, a lot of that solar is not injected directly into the grid. The model has a way uh, where, I, where I, I say that uh, when, the solar, when the solar gets too high, you must put it in storage and then you distribute it later when you can use it. So, so this 22,000 megawatt number here, it already has storage in West Texas that's utilizing this storage mechanism and sending the power. But if we had a total of uh, 22,000 megawatts of solar, we would generate enough energy so that we could retire all the coal plants. But you still have all the gas plants still left. The next line is a 50%. We're, we're going to reach 50% renewable energy. And you see we have to get the, we have to get the total mega, we have to get 88,000 megawatts of wind and solar into the system. And uh, we have 48 gigawatts of storage. And the storage has eight hours. And you put all that in there and you can, you can not only uh, get rid of the coal, but you can also get rid of another 6,300 megawatts of gas plants. This is to keep the LOLE at the point one. This, this model has no economics, it has no dispatch. All we're doing is we're just meeting the reliability requirement. Uh, then the last one is a 75% penetration level, and we've got a whole lot. We've got 148,000 megawatts of renewables. You know, this renewable, it's, it's easy to calculate. It's just an energy. All you're doing is just moving energy from renewables to serve the load. So, so the 75% here, it's just 75% of the energy needed to serve the annual load. That's all there is to it. But you have to make it work in the model. You have to put in enough storage so you can move the energy around so that you can get the, get the energy at the right times. Anyway, that amount of storage right there at, at uh, $250 per kW for uh, batteries, that's the current cost. I think I'll run this battery down. And $1 per watt, that's, that's a total uh, investment cost for storage of $385 billion. Sounds like a lot of money, but when you hear that Houston's going to have to have $180 billion to recover, maybe the $385 isn't, uh, isn't that bad. Do we have some time for questions? Yes. In fact, I'm through. Uh, the, this program is free. It's online. Uh, there's, some, there's a MATLAB version. Uh, contact me if you want to run it. OK. Yeah, questions? Yes. I can't hear you. Pump storage. Let me explain how I, how I built the pump storage. Um, so in the in the computer program, I I told it how many megawatts of pump storage and how many hours. That's the input data. Pump storage. So what's the program going to do? I mean, we could do, we could design pump storage different ways, but this is the way I designed it. The pump storage, it takes a 24-hour period, 
And it starts taking slices across the lower load levels, and it's looking at the energy. And it, it keeps increasing. It's trying, it's trying to find a megawatt level where it doesn't exceed the megawatt capability of the storage, and it also doesn't exceed the total hours. So it basically, it's a cut along the bottom. Once it's determined that megawatt level, that becomes a fixed number of megawatts that the rest of the system sees because the pump storage is taking that power. Now, the program has an, it has an efficiency number, and I put in 90%. It's going to take that energy, and it's going to move it to the peak, and it's going to take that amount of energy and shave off the peak within the next 24 hours. And it finds that level, and so it, that energy is used to clip the peak. That's how the program works. Okay, thanks. I don't know. Uh, California is pretty secretive on their pump storage. They don't share anything. I have no idea whether the pump storage works or not, but, but EIA 9, 960 lists how many megawatt hours of pump storage uh, was used. So at some point, we might want to compare the model with the EIA 9, 960 data. So uh, just out of curiosity, among the account market, among the, all of the storage techniques, uh, how many percentage is pump storage and how Not, many is battery? ERCOT has none. Nothing? The kind, of, the kind of storage that ERCOT is going for is for a few minutes. They're, okay. they're, they're trying to get enough storage so that they, they will give their more slowly reacting generators enough time to react. It, it, it's, it's not a storage for moving energy from one time of the day to the next. Their storage that they're trying, their market, their storage market is to, is to bring online an amount of storage that they think is necessary to handle these rapid ramp rates. They're trying to soften the ramp rates. Is it safe to type of stuff where they're using in Norway when they have to offset like a peak demand if there's not enough? Norway has enormous amounts of storage in their hydro. Oh. Germany uses Norway as a battery. Yeah. <laughs> it's very convenient for Germany. Well, I was just saying with pump storage, I was under the impression that the geography that they need, like for Texas it's fairly flat, so it won't be as viable here, but somewhere like California where it's more mountainous, they can actually benefit from it. So it really depends on the geography of the location. Let me tell you an idea I had. My idea was that we, we take a lagoon, down on the coast, we drench it out and drain the water out. We put wind generators around out. We put wind generators around to pump water out of the lagoon. We have a little hydro generator that lets the water run back in. We have pumped hydro on the coast. You know what's wrong with that idea? When you go a short distance off shore, off the coast, the wind dies. I have a, a Son-in-law, my daughter has a husband who does kite surfing. He says, oh, oh no, Jane, you can't go offshore any distance because the wind dies. This is why we don't have offshore wind in the Gulf is because it only blows right up close to the shore because that's where the thermal gradient is. That's why the wind generators are on shore. There's not enough wind out in the Gulf. But, but, the, pump, but the reverse pump storage, I, I saw uh, the Dutch were, were doing that. They were they would go out into the ocean and they would build a inverted uh, water tank and they pump, you know, the idea was to pump the ocean in and out to build pump storage. It's a great idea. You know, in the North Sea, if you can find a location where there's good wind and you can make that uh, big water tank, you, you could get really great pump storage there. Well, you hope, you hope that with solar scattered around everywhere that the diversity will just kind of smooth out. Especially when you have a lot of solar, like 75% solar. The real problem with what you're talking about is in the transmission system. You, could have, uh, you can have these huge power swings in a small area like the Dallas area. Uh, you can have a large power swing so the transmission system is at risk even though the whole grid has enough generation, there's no problem for the whole grid. So the transmission guys are freaking out over, over this.
possibility. And, and, and also, if you get too much solar on rooftops, you get into the problem where you're feeding power back into the grid, you can overload the distribution system. Same problem. How long uh, is the storage that would be needed to eliminate, like, coal production? Well, uh, you talked about this that. program out here does not store energy longer than one day. Okay. However, if, if you want to get, if you really want to get truly 100% renewables, you're going to need longer term storage. You need, you need this, the grain silo equivalent of energy storage because we're going to have dry years. And if we, if, we had, uh, if we had a way to store energy for a long time period from renewables, we would be okay because we could sort of store it up. Maybe we could even deliver that energy by chemical truck or something to where it's needed. We wouldn't even have to transmit the energy by wire. Uh, if, if we had a long-term storage mechanism, by the way, there are people working on this problem right now, chemicals and things like that that store the energy. Uh, but they don't have it working yet. That's a good question. Yeah. Incorporating any economics into the model, which you said no. And so I was kind of curious to speculate on, uh, well, A, to ask a question is when is there a, an absolute need for storage? I mean, when, when do well, we around, relate? Well, around, uh, your, your absolute need for storage is, Probably when you reach about 7,000 megawatts of solar in ERCOT, you're going to start running into some problems. At, uh, at 14,000 megawatts, for sure, you're going to need storage, which would help, unless you're just willing to throw away the energy like California's doing. Well, right and then I had the question about what uh, we'll start to see more regular uh, uh, low-value uh, energy events and maybe even negative values uh, based on distribution constraints, but won't that create interesting opportunity just because you're, will this, you have regularly create, available? It creates a huge reliability power. problem because these, these renewable resources are really keeping the energy prices down low. They're so low that the gas generators are going to be dropping off. And so we have a, we have a huge problem in, in maintaining the reliability because we, we can't keep enough gas generators running. This last case right here has an enormous amount of gas that never runs. So how do we pay these guys? You know, I mean, you're supposed to be selling energy, but they're just sitting there. I guess uh, it's 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 like it's our current problem to the extreme. I, I don't know. I, I just, Austin pays a lot of money to our bio, our wood burning plant. Hardly ever runs, but we're paying a lot of money for that. It's costing us $2 billion over 20 years. It's, it's awfully expensive to have a bunch of guys sitting around twiddling their thumbs. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Very good. Super, thanks. I think most of them kept up.